Hello everyone. On our channel, we continue exploring the Old Testament through the lens of Messianic Judaism. In today's video, we'll delve into Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, specifically chapters 5 and 6, focusing on the expression, do not be quick with your mouth. Feel free to subscribe to our channel to continue our exploration of the Old Testament within the context of Messianic Judaism. Today, we delve into Proverbs and Ecclesiastes chapters 5 to 6, focusing on the theme, do not be quick with your mouth. Chapter 5. This chapter emphasizes the importance of reverence and sincerity in approaching God. It warns against making rash vows or promises to God and advises caution in speech, urging people to listen more than they speak. The chapter also critiques the pursuit of wealth and material possessions, suggesting that they can lead to dissatisfaction and restlessness. Ultimately, it encourages contentment with what one has and emphasizes the transient nature of earthly riches. Chapter 6, Chapter 6 continues the theme of the fleeting nature of earthly pursuits and possessions. It explores the concept of vanity and the futility of human efforts to find lasting fulfillment. Despite striving for success and wealth, the chapter suggests that people often fail to find true satisfaction. It highlights the uncertainty of life and the inevitability of death, encouraging readers to reflect on the brevity of existence and to find contentment in the simple pleasures of life. Join us for insightful discussions and a deeper understanding of these biblical teachings. Solomon rushes to caution his son against one of the common sins of youth. Those who heed wise advice and learn from the experiences of others cultivate true discernment. Since their speech is pure and true, it keeps them from harm. Nothing but the Word of God serves as adequate protection against the corruption and deceit that abound in our day. Therefore, the Apostle Paul exhorts Timothy, surrounded by apostasy, to hold fast to the word 2 Timothy 3 13, 17. In chapter 5, the topic of vows is central. Often, in challenging times, people turn to making vows as a practical solution. Throughout the Bible, there are instances where God's people resorted to making vows when all else seemed to fail. Remember how Jephthah made a vow to sacrifice whatever came out of his house first to greet him, only for it to be his daughter. He couldn't have foreseen such an outcome. Or think about the Gibeonites, who deceived the Israelites by pretending to be from a distant land, fearing destruction, because God commanded the Israelites to destroy the nearby nations. They dressed in worn clothes and carried stale bread to make their story convincing. The Israelites didn't seek God's counsel and made a vow to them, leading to a famine in David's time. Despite David being a beloved figure, God remembered the vow made to the Gibeonites. Proverbs teaches us to prepare ourselves before praying and not to approach God thoughtlessly. It says that one should not be like someone who tempts the Lord. In other words, Think carefully before you speak to God. When you pray, it's important to be thoughtful and deliberate. God advises us to consider our words carefully before speaking to Him. Don't just say whatever comes to mind because you're communicating with God, not a fellow human. The passage also mentions that just as dreams come from many cares, hasty words and prayer can come from a troubled mind. Sometimes, people mistake dreams for divine revelations. However, not all dreams are from God, some are merely reflections of our busy minds. While God does speak through dreams, we must discern which are truly from Him. So the Lord advises us to approach our vows and prayers with care and reverence. When words are many, the more foolish a person is, the more they talk. A wise person measures their words. James says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. You've said a lot, but you can't take it back. God teaches us that even a fool can seem wise if they keep silent. Once they speak, it becomes clear who they are. Regarding vows, Ecclesiastes 5.3 says, When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin, and do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your words and destroy the work of your hands? Fear God. 
Do not make promises you cannot keep. Think carefully about what you can realistically accomplish. If you know it's beyond your capability, do not promise. Sometimes, people make vows in moments of emotional distress. For example, a girl, hurt by a breakup, might vow never to marry. At 17, she makes this promise to God, but as she grows older, her circumstances change. By the time she's 25 or 30, seeing other families and children, she might regret her vow. God says, why speak hastily? Later, it becomes a mistake a promise made in haste. God might say, why make a promise that leads to your harm? There are people who break their vows and marry despite their promises. Take your time, no one forces you to vow. Live as a single person for a year or two and see if it suits you before making a vow. Don't promise until you're wiser. Vows are serious. Sometimes people make them in dire situations too. In times of trouble, vows come quickly. You know how that story goes someone falls off a balcony and cries out, God, if you save me, I will serve you. Then they catch onto the balcony and think, why didn't I think of that sooner? When we are scared, we make vows quickly. But when the fear passes, we question why we made those promises. God says we can't play games with him. It's one thing to pray to God out of anxiety, but it's another to make vows during those times. In Psalms, it says, fulfill your vows to God. Vows are very effective, but they come with responsibility. They work, but God will hold you accountable if you don't fulfill them. If you see oppression of the poor or injustice in court, don't be surprised because one higher than the high officials watches over them, and there is someone even higher than them. The supreme authority over the land is the king who is supposed to look out for the country. How do you think the end of this verse connects with the beginning? If you see oppression that's clear. The poor, the orphan, and the widow are often oppressed because they cannot defend themselves. The end of the verse refers to the higher authority watching over these matters. It's likely that Solomon is concluding his thought with this idea oppression occurs but a higher authority oversees everything. High officials might oppress the poor, but over them, there is a higher authority, which is God. No matter how powerful someone is, there is always a higher authority above them. This is how we should understand the verse. For instance, no matter how high-ranking an official you are, there is always a higher authority above you. God tells pastors through Apostle Peter to be humble in their authority, because God is watching over them too. So being a pastor is significant, but remember, you are also under God's authority. You can't just do whatever you want because there is a God in heaven who has no superior. Above every high authority, there is a higher one, and above all these high authorities, there is God. So if the poor are oppressed, there is a God in heaven who sees it all. Those who oppress the poor should remember that no matter their power, wealth, or status, there is a God above them who is not impressed by their achievements. God has the power to hold them accountable. This serves as a reminder to those in positions of power to remember that God is above them as well. Whoever loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, and whoever loves wealth will never have enough. This too is meaningless. As wealth increases, so do those who consume it. What benefit is there to the owner except to feast their eyes on it? Those who love money will never find satisfaction in it. How can we test ourselves? We humans have a tendency to defend ourselves. When we read the Bible, we often think it applies to others, not to us, but rather to someone else like Vasya. Let's reflect on this. Money is necessary for everyone we use it to buy bread, clothes, and pay for utilities. Money itself is not evil. However, some people have money and understand it should be used for the benefit of people they use it wisely without letting it control them. At what point do money and wealth start controlling you? How can this be described? Write your thoughts in the comments below this video. First point, if a poor person is in trouble and I don't want to help, it shows I love money. When money stands above moral obligations, above family ties and human connections, it becomes an idol. 
If you become so obsessed with money that you even deny yourself basic comforts, then you don't understand the purpose of money. Money is meant to improve your life, but if you live solely for the sake of money, you miss its true purpose. Feel free to subscribe to our channel for more discussions on the Old Testament in the context of Messianic Judaism. Today we continue exploring the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, focusing on the theme, do not be quick with your mouth, join us, as we delve into the wisdom of these ancient texts and apply their lessons to our modern lives. Why does God give money to people? Write your opinion in the comments on this video. Now let's continue. Do you serve money or does money serve you? Stinginess can determine one's love for money. For example, there is a woman who goes shopping frequently. She is generous and doesn't mind spending her husband's money, enjoying herself. On the other hand, her husband is seen as a miser because he earns the money and worries about where it comes from. Take Judas, for instance. His downfall began with his love for money, which he couldn't overcome. Let's read further, verse 10. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. This means that no matter how much money you have, you won't be able to consume it all. More wealth inevitably attracts more people who will need to be taken care of and fed. God suggests that accumulating more money is essentially pointless because it will be used to support others. It makes sense in a way. When a person knows how to make money, their wealth grows. In contrast, the poor don't seem to increase their wealth. Rich people marry other rich people, further increasing their wealth. However, Christ wasn't talking about this. The point here isn't that being rich is a sin, but that one shouldn't be controlled by money. Let's read further. The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich permits them no sleep. When a person works hard, they come home, fall into bed, and sleep well regardless of whether they've eaten a lot or a little. They don't think about it because they are so tired. A rich person, however, may eat well but still struggle to sleep. Everyone knows this is true if you work hard, you sleep well. Yet nobody wants to work hard, everyone wants to be rich, even though they know that working hard provides better sleep than wealth. Nobody wants to toil, everyone desires to be rich, even though they know deep down that working hard gives a more fulfilling sleep than wealth ever could. If you work hard mixing concrete all day, you'll sleep like a rock without needing antidepressants or sleeping pills. You'll barely make it home before collapsing into bed. Yet, rich people often struggle to sleep, and despite knowing that hard work ensures better rest, people still pray for wealth. There is a grievous evil under the sun wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. As everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This, too, is a grievous evil as everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain, since they toil for the wind? All their days they eat in darkness, with great frustration, affliction, and anger. At funerals, it is often said that as one comes into the world with nothing, so they leave with nothing. They arrive with clenched fists and leave with open hands. What benefit is it to accumulate wealth if it is lost in the end? People often say that it's true we can't take anything with us when we die. The Lord tells us that what we have doesn't come to us easily. It's written that we work in frustration, darkness, sorrow, and anger, often undernourished. We work and work, and then we die, leaving everything behind. It feels unfair, but that's how it is. There's a story of a man who built large barns and said to himself, Eat, drink, and be merry, but the Lord said, You fool. This very night your soul will be demanded from you, that's how life can be. We often push ourselves to the limit, working tirelessly without even having time to sleep, because we desire to have a lot. But is it really worth it? Should we work ourselves to the bone, living away from our families and toiling in difficult conditions just to have more? Maybe it's better to make do with less rather than paying such a high price. Ultimately, it's a personal choice, and each person must decide for themselves. There's also a verse, the twelfth one, that talks about wealth being harmful. As a sheikh from Dubai expressed, and you can find this online, he said, 
My grandfather rode a camel. My father drove something better. I drive a Range Rover. My son will drive an expensive car. And my grandson will ride a camel again. This is true because when you grow up in a poor family, you learn to earn money and survive. You have the incentive to strive. But when children are well off, they don't have to think about anything. Everything is ready, the house, the car. And they degrade because they don't know how to survive. Their children, raised by these degraded parents, won't have anything. As long as the grandfather who cared for his child is alive, he will also think about his grandchildren. But once he's gone, it's unlikely the great-grandchildren will get any help. That's why this parable is true. In what other cases can wealth be harmful? Wealth can make a person arrogant, proud, heartless, greedy, and haughty. I'm not saying this applies to everyone, but wealth has this power. Families fall apart over money because they don't know what else they need. They become restless from excess and then get divorced. It's true. When there's not enough money for bread, both partners work and try to figure out how to survive. Incidentally, the reluctance to have many children, which Christianity has rejected, also stems from this. When there's enough money, people are less inclined to have large families. This serves as an important motivator to preserve oneself in peace and avoid unnecessary conflicts and discord. When there are many children to raise and support, families have less time for futile arguments and impractical ideas. Focusing on children helps to steer clear of unwanted developments and contributes to a happy and harmonious life. This can be particularly crucial when there are many children, as it demands more attention and effort from parents yet it also brings more joy and satisfaction from life. Verse 17 also underscores the importance of enjoying life and making use of the opportunities granted by God for the pleasure derived from work and one's possessions. If a person has the ability to enjoy the goodness bestowed upon them, it can be considered as a blessing from God. However, it is important to remember that all of this is a gift from God, and it is necessary to appreciate it and remember that it is temporary while God rewards his followers with joy in their hearts. Indeed, in this world, there is joy from good food, relaxation, and the pleasures of life. And this is not considered a sin. God desires for us to enjoy the blessings he gives us, but at the same time, to remember the importance of spirituality in the development of faith. You're very transient, and God, who loves us, strives to ensure that we find some joy in life. Here, it's mentioned as a divine gift a person may possess wealth and property, but if God doesn't grant them the wisdom to utilize these resources, they won't truly benefit from them. God insists that in order to benefit from these gifts, one must seek His grace. So if you have been given the means to utilize wealth and possessions, you should consider yourself blessed by God. However, it's essential to understand that having wealth doesn't necessarily equate to happiness. You could be living in luxury with money stashed away, yet lack true fulfillment. The reform of currency or the accumulation of papers may not bring satisfaction. You may find yourself working towards an idea without truly comprehending its essence, only to realize later in life that time has flown by and your appetite for life has diminished. This is why it's considered a divine gift when you not only possess wealth but also have the wisdom to use it wisely. Yet, it's crucial to acknowledge that not all wealth is from God. Sometimes people attribute wealth to divine blessings when it may actually be a temptation from Satan. Some Christians believe that everything they receive is from God, while others acknowledge that there are instances where Satan may offer worldly gains in exchange for worship. However, true blessings from God come with His grace and the ability to utilize wealth and possessions for the greater good. Indeed, God is not the devil. Unlike God, the devil has no intention of bestowing blessings upon anyone and does not have any positive influence on human life. Therefore, when we observe someone possessing something valuable or material, it is not always appropriate to attribute it to God. Now, concerning the sixth chapter. In life, situations often arise where a person obtains wealth, fame, and everything their soul desires, but cannot make use of it. Instead, these blessings may be utilized by another person causing frustration and dissatisfaction. This is referred to as vanity and a heavy burden as it weighs heavily on the soul. 
Now let's consider a specific example. For instance, during a time of war, a person builds a house but fails to complete its renovation due to adverse circumstances. Later on, they are forced to relocate to another area. However, when they left their house, it became the dwelling for other people who suffer the consequences of the disaster. This situation may seem perplexing to us, prompting us to question why such a turn of events was allowed by God. But it's unfortunate, indeed. Of course we wouldn't wish such circumstances upon our own homes, and we wouldn't wish harm upon those people. There are good people among us, our brothers and sisters, fine Christians who have worked hard. I believe God allowed them to have to move to other countries. I think God will take care of them there, and they'll be no worse off than if some man had fathered 100 children and lived for many years. Even if his days were multiplied, his soul wouldn't enjoy the good, and he wouldn't even have a burial. I would say a stillborn child is happier than him because he came in vain and goes into darkness, and his name will be covered in darkness. He never saw or knew the sun. He's more at peace than that one, even if he lived 2,000 years and didn't enjoy any good, or if all went to one place. There are two kinds of evil, says God. The first is when you die, and the crows peck at your eyes because you weren't even buried. When we read the book of Kings, we see that all the kings God loved were mourned by the people. God didn't let a single one die without mourning, and we don't know where they all were mourned, and all were buried in royal tombs. But apostates were buried like dogs, apostates from God. So the Lord says if a person dies and lies as a corpse on the ground, it's not a display of God's blessing. When you just lie there and crows peck at your eyes, a person deserves burial, so they bury you. Remember the book of Tobit, though it's not canonical. Tobit, being a holy man, buried the brothers of the Israelites who were dead under the threat of death. He understood that it wasn't good for God's people to just lie there and not be buried. So Solomon says it's not very good if this is your fate. And the second evil is to live a life without enjoying what you've earned. This idea is a symptom of poverty. If you grew up in a poor family like I did, you might remember always regretting not being able to buy something because there wasn't enough money. And when you finally have money, sometimes you think about buying something and then think, it's too expensive and go home because there's something to buy. Because you can afford it. This is a symptom of poverty. When you live in that way, it's like a curse. You regret buying what you have money for. You regret it. You can't do that. It's evil. If you have money, buy and eat. Eat your fill. You deserve it. Buy and eat. Indeed, it's true that people who don't understand the value of money might frivolously spend on iPhones that cost thousands. But when you reflect on how you've lived, you think, where would I find the money to spend on something so extravagant? Why not dress more simply? But this generation doesn't understand that. Those who have experienced hardship understand the value of money. But God says that, overall, it's not good. It's written in days of prosperity. Enjoy the good and in days of adversity. Consider, and this is what God gives you. In times of adversity, you save and God gives you money. Don't live in the past. If you have money today, buy yourself food, dress comfortably. Make your life comfortable. If you live in a four-story house in the village, but the bathroom is so uncomfortable that you can't even sit comfortably, then install underfloor heating, make the bathroom more convenient. Yes, it's expensive, but living your whole life in the cold, in discomfort, is worse. Why? Because all the toil of man is for his mouth, and yet the soul is not satisfied. What advantage does the wise man have over the fool? What advantage does the poor man have who knows how to walk before the living? All the toil is for the mouth. We work solely for sustenance. It doesn't give anything for salvation. It doesn't give anything for life. You can live your whole life for sustenance and not see anything greater. It's like an animal's level of existence. An animal eats and can't see beyond that. But a human should see a little more than the animal level of life. The soul is not nourished by bread. It's better to see with your eyes than to torment your soul. This is also vanity and striving after wind. 
You can dream about who knows what and torture yourself that you're not like that. But it's really a shame, isn't it? Of course, we wouldn't want things to be like that with our homes, and we won't wish ill on those people. Our brothers and sisters are good people, our wonderful Christians who have worked hard. I believe that God has long been watching over them, and He allowed them to move to other countries. I think God will take care of them there, and it won't be worse for them than if someone had fathered a hundred children and lived many years, yet didn't enjoy the good things of life. And when he dies, even his name will be forgotten. He never saw the sun or knew anything, and he rested more peacefully than the one who lived a long life but never enjoyed the good things. So it's written if God gives some man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. Sometimes Christians think that if God gives you money, then brothers and sisters, let's thank God because God gave me money. If God gave you money, let's pray. Sometimes for believers, everything they receive is from God, without Satan, without anything evil. That's our human measure, not God's. There are times when Christ and Satan offer options. Bow down to me, says Satan. Sometimes a person bows down to demons. And for this they might have visible prosperity, but if God wants to bless a believing person and give them something, there's no need to say that the devil gave it because God gives wealth and allows you to use it. You can thank God and rejoice for what you have, for what you've eaten, for what you're wearing. Glory to you, O Lord. Rather than spending your whole life being dissatisfied, fantasizing and dreaming, what kind of life would it be to always be grateful for what you have, as it is? God will give even better. But those who complain all their lives will lose even what they have, what exists. That's why it's already named, and it's known that this is a person, and that she can't argue with the one who is stronger than her. There are many such things that multiply vanity. What's better for a person? Who knows what's good for a person in the days of all the futile life they spend like a shadow? And who can tell them what will be after them under the sun? What's better for a person? Let's end here, because the seventh is a bit long. What's better for a person? In summary of what we've read in two chapters, I believe that you'll hear me. It's hard not to be confused, because these words are like a delicacy that enters our soul, generally summarizing what we've read. A person should learn to be content with what they have and enjoy the fruits of their labor. Work hard then relax, eat, rest, and rejoice in each day. It will never happen again, it will never return. Specifically today, your happiness doesn't paint images of distant life. When you're happy, because you don't know what tomorrow will bring, maybe tomorrow's days will be even worse than today's. Live today, eat what you have, thank God, enjoy what you have. Thank God for the woman who is just like that. While a person's eye may not follow them into a brothel, a hotel room, or a secret rendezvous, God sees all that unfolds. Secret sin on earth is open scandal in heaven. One cannot indulge in sin without consequences. The inexorable outcomes of sin are inevitable. Sinful habits are hard to overcome, but if not overcome, they bind their victim ever tighter. Man finds himself firmly ensnared by the cords of his own sin. Gradually, he discovers that sin, like a descending spiral, constantly pulls him downward. He becomes a captive, bound by ever-tightening bonds. Ultimately, he becomes a slave to sin. She'll cook you food, tidy up, and cuddle you. Who has a wife? Who has a wife just like that? She's the best because she's alive. After analyzing the research text, several key conclusions can be drawn. Gratitude is the key to happiness. One of the main lessons we derive from the text is the significance of gratitude for what we already have in our lives. Thankfulness to God for our present blessings and opportunities helps us see the light in each day. Life is today the pursuit of living in the present and cherishing the moment is another important takeaway. Rejecting dreams of a distant future and relishing the present allows us to derive maximum enjoyment from life. Close relationships are our most valuable asset. The text underscores the importance of close relationships, especially in the context of familial support and understanding. Relationships where there is mutual care and support are genuine treasures. 
Overall, the text emphasizes the importance of living in the moment, the value of gratitude, and the significance of close relationships in our lives. Subscribe to our channel for more insightful discussions on the Old Testament and its relevance to our lives today. Don't miss out on our deep dives into biblical wisdom and teachings. Hit that subscribe button and join our community.